need to be sung, but tales that need to be told as well. And when I came to my first Lilies, I thought I knew what a bard was. I won the bardic championship of my barony, I had a fancy cloak, and I thought I was hot. And then I came to the bardic pavilion at Lilies, and I watched Michael the Ram and Dolan and all of these visionary figures show me what it really meant to be a bard. And Michael the Ram taught me a story from my own persona's culture, Japanese, that night. He just pulled it out of his hat. And it's one I love, but it's one I've stopped telling as much because I told it a lot in my first year. But in memory of the people that taught me what it is to be a bard, I always try to keep it alive. Also, sorry that it's a bring down, but this is Kalantir. It couldn't be happy for too long. <laughs> <laughs> Once, many years ago, in the lands of Nippon, called Japan by the foreigners, there lived the governor, a man renowned for both his wisdom and his capriciousness. He liked to throw, as all important men do, great parties. And great parties, of course, demand great parties. Plates. And he had 12 of the greatest plates that had ever been made. Each one was made by a different master potter, each one painted by a different master painter. They were beautiful. So worthwhile were these plates that he employed one servant whose only job was to care for these plates. Before dinner, she would open up the cupboards and take them out carefully set them at each plate place and wait. And after the dinner, she alone would pick them up, take them back, and wash them each by hand. And then she would open up the cabinet, and as she put them away, she would count each me, son, she, go, rook, seech, hatch, Ku, Ju, Juich, Juni, and close the cap. But the governor was, as I said, capricious. And one day he decided to test his servant. And so he threw a great party and invited great guests that demanded the great place. And after she had set them out, he took one away and hid it in his rooms where she would not look. The dinner went on and the servant took the plates at the end of it and stacked them to take them and wash them by hand with care and she opened it up and she counted again. Do each, there was no plate. Panic filled her heart. These plates were literally more valuable than she was. These plates were her life. She searched the house high and low, looking everywhere they possibly could be. She couldn't find them. It was gone. She had lost the plate. And in her grief at failing this great duty, she ran into the courtyard, threw herself into the well, and died. The governor was shocked. He had never meant to cause the death of what was clearly his most loyal servant. So he paid a high price to her family so that they would not feel want in her honor, and he tried to repay the debt of honor that he had created. He thought that it would settle and time would go on and he would learn. But the very next night, as he lay awake in his bed, he started to hear a scratching, faint at first, but growing ever louder, a scratching said, oh, it's, it's the wind against the, against the walls. But finally he could stand it no more and he walked forward and he flung open his shutters. Just in time to see two hands coming out over the edge of the well. And the drowned servant pulling herself out. He watched in horror as she shuffled to the center of the courtyard and opened up cupboards that only she could see. He began to put away ghostly plates, counting. But where before her voice had been sweet, now it was 
even if it is after death. 